Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this latest teaching session in the course on technology in the future of medicine. Today we're talking about one of the mainstays of the course, that is the technological singularity. So this is the technological singularity explained and promoted. <clears throat> the objectives for today, understand that you should not fear complexity. Real life is complex, right? All models are kind of appealing and shiny and stuff because they're a little bit simpler than real life, but you all like real life, so you shouldn't be afraid of complexity. And uh, so that probably means there's not like one great truth, there are multiple truths and truth changes and all that sort of stuff. So I'm, I'm gonna tell you about schools of belief about the singularity and the four main paths, but it's not like some of them are right and some are wrong. They're, they're, they're just multiple approaches here. And I'm also going to present to you um, the history of the singularity and of Marcus Hutter's main ideas about it. And I borrowed about 38 slides from him they don't quite look like, if you've watched his uh, presentation, not exactly the same because we changed the PowerPoint template, right? So we have my cheerful blue PowerPoint <laughs> template with his uh, depressing slides. So, so some of them are, are, are kind of uh, combined like that. And uh, finally, just when you've reached the point of abject depression and you think you can't take any more, we'll talk about uh, Future Day and, and uh, this idea of a new uh, holiday and how we can promote things. So the last part of the presentation is cheerful and upbeat. Uh, uh, so <laughs> I don't want you to think we're just getting deeper and deeper into the morass of human in significance. Do not fear complexity. There's beauty in complexity. The real world is complex. Uh, for instance, in my area of transplantation pathology, writing about the future, the future is really fourfold. There are four different things happening. They're all happening. They seem remarkably different. But one is really boring, but that is the promotion of deceased donor donation. When somebody dies, having an increased number of people donate their or organs. That, that's, that's one thing that would uh, improve things in the future. The other would be uh, immunologic tolerance, where you could tolerate like it was self, an organ from some other person, so you wouldn't have to treat with uh, immunosuppressive drugs. Then there's the idea of tissue engineering to repair organs. And then there's the idea of stem cell creation of new organs. Now those four ideas may seem like each of them is sort of counter the other and so on, but actually all four of those things are happening and kind of creating the future for that area of uh, medicine. I think many other things are like that. So when you're at a party in the evening and talking about ideas, one idea may really appeal to you more than, than others, but maybe the real world is that a lot of different things are all moving forward. And Peter Diamandis, who is one of the founders of uh, uh, Singularity University and the founder of uh, uh, the X Prize, you know that the X Prize was responsible for the success of um, private space flight and uh, autonomous vehicles and the, the doctor in your cell phone. Many other uh, uh, initiatives were moved forward by this idea of creating a large financial prize, getting a lot of people to spend money competing for this prize. And you can accomplish many things in that undemocratic uh, system that you can't, can't uh, seem to get done in any other way. Anyway, he said, when faced with a choice between two desirable goals, choose both. So that's kind of the you know, philosophy here. Talked about the singularity before. Just for those of you who are wrestling with this idea, 
Uh, I think that um, the Rich Sutton uh, presentation from uh, December the 3rd is, is really easy to understand. That, that's a good way to kind of uh, maybe approach this. The Marcus Hutter side of it, which I'm going to give you today, is <laughs> sort of the most difficult way to, to think about it, but one, one of the more, more in intriguing also. So it's the idea of machines becoming smarter than we are and what happens next. <clears throat> so how does that work exactly? Well, in Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, you remember that a world is confronted that's much more organic than expected. Pre playing croquet and everything's alive, right? The mallet is a flamingo and the ball is a hedgehog. So everything is uncooperative and living and so on. And like biology is everywhere, right? Even in uh, what you thought were uh, inanimate objects. And you remember this quote? I'm counting on the fact that Alice in Wonderland is sort of cross-cultural. So no matter, with, I, I mean, the, in theory at least, you're all uh, familiar with this. There is this line, the main difficulty Alice had was in managing her flamingo, describing the croquet game. Well, the future we're looking at is exactly the opposite of that. So rather than uh, um, a world that's much more organic, it could be a completely inorganic world. In the technological singularity, we face a world that's much less organic than expected and could develop without us. Maybe it doesn't need us at all. Okay, so the three main schools of belief about the technological singularity, accelerating change, event horizon, and intelligence explosion. <clears throat> there are four main paths. So within each of those schools, one path is the idea of creating an artificial intelligence that exceeds human intelligence. Another path is creating a human computer interface, sort of a cyborgian entity, that allows humans to go beyond their innate intelligence to a significant extent. This is the so-called cybernetic singularity. Third way is to find ways in biology to improve upon the natural human intellect. Now that's certainly possible. It is likely that that's the slowest of these four. And because it's the slowest, it's the least likely to happen. And this idea of our intelligence evolving through biology relates a lot to David Pierce's teaching session on February 27th. Um, he's talking about genetic engineering to change our offspring in specific ways. It's, a, it's kind of a creepy idea, but it, uh, he's talking about resetting the set point for feeling pain and pleasure so that our offspring can only feel varying degrees of pleasure and no pain. But there are a bunch of other things that you could also conceivably select for, and one would be uh, intellect, but it would be slow. And so it, it, it's not likely to be the first thing that, ha that happens. And the fourth path then is the internet wakes up build large computer networks in which beyond human intelligence emerges. And all these different variations on the belief in the singularity and how it might occur are reflected in the courses at uh, Singularity University and in the, in the experience that I had there in the uh, executive program in the spring of 2010. And it's an interesting educational experience. I hope this one is a little bit like it, but I don't guarantee it. Most courses that you take, your knowledge of the subject matter
tails off very rapidly after the course ends. And maybe the next day, you remember only half, and the day after, you're down to an eighth. And within a few days, you, you, you have lost almost everything, except maybe those portions of the course where you know, the prof did something really unusual, like jump on the table or something. But otherwise, you lose most of it. But at the Singularity University nine-day executive program, it was sort of the opposite of that, that the experience grew. You met all these people, you had all these cool contacts, you, you were exposed to a whole new world, and really the course didn't end. I mean, when it officially ended, it was just you were leaving the NASA Ames campus, but you were staying in contact, you were sort of beginning a new life having to do with the things that you learned in that course. So it kind of um, becomes more vivid rather than less vivid with uh, time. And, and uh, so it's, it's kind of a cool thing to, to experience. Uh, it's a picture of me at the course, and this is a slide you've seen before, but I've updated it to include the fact that <coughs> It's true that I was pushing for new cross-disciplinary structures in universities to better prepare us for the future. I was pushing for that as if I expected somebody else to do it, and then I realized maybe I'm the logical person to do it. <clears throat> and this course is the expression of that wish. Presently, we know of no similar courses except for Bertolin Mesco's social media and medicine course in Budapest, Hungary. Hungary, and um, he does have an active interest in this course. The slide share version of the PowerPoint I'm presenting to you today, um, he um, started to follow my slide share uh, entries this morning. So <laughs> he is sort of pay, paying attention to what we're doing in this course, and I'm, of course, quite interested in how his course is. Going. We hope that uh, eventually there are hundreds of similar courses that will appear in universities all over the world. And <coughs> the, um, just to kind of balance off the kind of uh, dystopic uh, to and uh, scary and uh, not very pleasant to th think about things I'm about to present to you, remember Peter Diamandis' idea of the world of uh, abundance, which is a future possibility where the cost of everything descends to approximately zero, so you can have everything, anything that you want. And um, uh, virtual reality becomes widely accessible. It's something you can take in groups, you can do with your friends, and becomes better than real uh, reality. So, that is possible, that kind of uh, utopia may be the future. Um, every now and then you'll hear criticisms of Ray Kurzweil um, that he's narrow and he hasn't thought about this, that, or the other thing, but the thing you realize about Ray Kurzweil's career, he wrote a book in 98, which is a long time ago. I don't know if all of you were live in 98, I guess so. Anyway, but 98 was like eons ago, and his book in 2005 was not like a new book. His book in 2005 was a reaction to all the criticism of his 1998 book. And so he is like working full time to respond to uh, critiques. So the idea that you in some e evening when you're really starting to sound really smart and your friends are really impressed. You've come up with this idea of a flaw in, in what Ray Kurzweil is doing and you, you, you think he's very narrow and hasn't thought about this, that, and the other thing. The thing to remember is he is accessible. You can write to him and if you do, he'll write back. And um, he will likely partly agree with the point that you've made and then bring up a bunch of related points that you never thought about. 
And you'll really learn from that interchange and you'll see he's as broad as the university that he founded. So he, he's heard all the arguments. He's sort of in a full-time job of listening to people criticize his ideas and reacting back to them. So when you hear somebody arguing that he holds narrow, rigid views, that's a false straw man argument. Um, okay. Now the history of the technological singularity goes back to 1847 and the creation of the four-function mechanical calculator. Now this is something rather mundane to you. You may not have thought about this as much of a relevant technology, but it was a pretty big deal in its day. And what Thornton and he was writing in uh, a periodical that you may not be familiar with, but it's uh, called The Expounder of Primitive Christianity. So anyway, what he wrote was, this is about the four-function mechanical calculator. Such machines by which the scholar may, by turning a crank, grind out the solution of a problem without the fatigue of mental application would, by its introduction in the schools, do incalculable injury. But who knows that such machines, when brought to greater perfection, may not think of a plan to remedy all their own defects and then grind out ideas beyond the ken of mortal mind. So this is the idea even in 1847 of the machines becoming smarter than we are. And also, you know, go back at the time of Plato, Aristotle, they were talking about how the written word is making us lazy, that during the time when all history was oral and that's all we had, people were able to recall huge, long, wonderful poems about what had happened in the past. When people learned how to write, <laughs> He came less good at that. So, you know, there are many ways to think of, you know, technology advances, but many things like writing that we accept unequivocally as a positive thing. Uh, there, there was a time when even writing was uh, controversial. There was only a special category of human beings called scribes that wrote. Even kings and queens couldn't write. Uh, so, it, but uh, thinking then about this, this idea of machines becoming smarter than we are, <clears throat> in 1863, four years after Darwin published On the Origin of the Species, Samuel Butler published a letter. It was partly uh, intended to be humorous. Darwin Among the Machines. It compared human evolution to machine evolution prophesizing half in jest that machines would eventually replace man in the supremacy of the earth. In the course of ages, we shall find ourselves the inferior race. The letter raises many of the themes now being de debated by proponents of the technological singularity. Um, and then Samuel Butler, in his book, Erewhon, which most of you know is nowhere spelled backwards, right? <laughs> Butler argued that there is no security against the ultimate development of mechanical consciousness. In fact, of machines possessing little consciousness now, a mollusk has not much consciousness reflect upon the extraordinary advance which machines have made during the last few hundred years. And note how slowly the animal and vegetable kingdoms are advancing. The more highly organized machines are creatures not so much of yesterday, but as of the last five minutes, so to speak, in comparison with past time. So once again, the, the idea is there that in the right conditions, machines could evolve infinitely more quickly than we can. We're really limited in our uh, biology and how quickly we can evolve. 
Okay, now the next 28 slides are modified from the slide presentation of Marcus Hutter that I've given you the link to. Um, so the history of the technological sing singularity using that word <coughs> goes back to Stanislaw Ulam in 1958, I.J. Good in 65, Ray Solomonoff in, eight, in 1985, and Werner Vinge in 1993. Werner Vinge is a science fiction author. He is still quite active, and he's frequently uh, interviewed about the history here. And then the widespread popularization of the idea came from Ray Kurzweil with his 98, 2005, and 2012 books. And uh, with the uh, events, the Singularity Summit meetings from 2006 and onward, and organizations, uh, the Singularity University, as I told you, um, in my first lecture, Singularity University is, is taking over most other uh, singularitarian entities, in, including uh, Singularity Summit, which they now own, uh, Singularity Hub, many other things that have, have that word they now own. The philosopher David Chalmers became in, interested in this area in 2010 and has written on it uh, extensively since then. Marcus Hutter's m major work was in 2012, The uh, sing Singularity Inside and Out. So you're familiar with Moore's Law and the uh, exponential nature of price uh, performance of computing and the idea that it won't be long before computers are not just smarter than individual humans, but smarter than all humanity together. And uh, you can imagine that beyond that, um, it, it's rather hard to predict where things will go. Now those of you who have seen the movie Her or are <laughs> planning to see it, one striking thing about it, it's a very benign world. It's Los Angeles of the future, and the buildings are more beautiful than the Los Angeles of today. Is more open space. It, it, it looks like a somewhat uh, um, uh, happy uh, outcome for the future. Um, and I would say that just because a, a movie with this theme has been created doesn't mean that that's what the future will, will be. But it, it is, it's been pointed out that if we really had AI that's that smart, that why wouldn't it, it have influenced the you know, economy and other things? In that movie, it sort of seems like you know, relationships have changed, but nothing else has, except that the buildings are more beautiful and the Los Angeles uh, scenery nicer than the scenery of uh, today. <clears throat> So it's, it's hard to predict what's going to happen. Presently in Moore's Law, uh, computing power doubles every 1.5 years. That's now been valid for 50 years. As long as there's demand for more computing power, Moore's Law could continue to hold um, for many more decades before computronium is reached. That means turning everything into computers, turning the whole world into uh, computers. We're not sure that that will ever occur. <clears throat> so in 20 to 30 years, the raw computing power of a single computer will equal the computing power of a uh, human brain. So there should be human level AI in 20 to 30 years. So Kurzweil's prediction of the technological Sing singularity is in 2045, which is 31 years from now. Um, <clears throat> there has been, in the course of human history, an acceleration of doubling patterns. 
During the hunter-gatherer Stone Age era, um, there was doubling of the size of the uh, economy every 250,000 years. It's kind of slow, and then in the agricultural farming period, every 900 years after the uh, industrial revolution every 15 years. In the computer-dominated world of today, every 1.5 years. And with superhuman intelligence, uh, <laughs> imagine that, you know, economy can, can double very, very quickly. Um, so, um, uh, one thing that, that is you know, amusing is if you look at uh, Hansen's uh, predictions of the future, he has powerful people, these are mainly virtual people, not real biological people, being very, very small because near the hub of activity where most of the stock market stuff is, is going on, you need to be able to communicate very quickly and being small and close to the center helps. And he has recently criticized the Her movie, saying it's like the Titanic, where the story thread in the Titanic, the comparable story thread would be the ship hits the iceberg, and people say, hey, you know, now we have all this extra space, and we've got new like ventilation going through the ships, and all the positive things about being hit by an iceberg and no possibility of the ship sinking. So that, that's what he, he thinks is going on in her, where you're just looking at all the positive things about the AI and none of the negative. But if you look at his, his own writing about the future, these very, very small, powerful people seem just as, as unlikely as, as the future in, in the movie Her. Kurzweil talks about the six epochs of uh, evolution. Uh, and the final one of these, um, final two, are the merger of technology with the human beings. And finally, the universe, the universe wakes up. So, so the whole universe becoming sentient in the final phase. So Marcus Hutter asks, is the singularity negotiable? Um, and I think his basic conclusion is no. <laughs> that uh, with the appearance of uh, above human intellect uh, AI, this initiates a detonation cord toward the singularity, which is a point of no return. There is no going back. Maybe the singularity is already unavoidable now. Politically, it's very difficult, but not impossible, to resist technology or market forces. It would be similarly difficult to prevent a AGI, that's um, a, um, artificial general intelligence kind of uh, intelligence that computers need to be smarter than human beings, and even more so to prevent the development of faster computers. You could um, conceivably do that in an individual country, but then the things would just take off in other countries. Whether we are before, at, or beyond the point of no return is also phil philosophically intricate, as it depends upon how much free will one attributes to people and society. You all feel you have free will, but do you really? Is it, is, is it really you know, predicted what what, what you're going to do in the future. Um, you can think of one kind of analogy of politics and the inevitability of global warming. Another uh, analogy is a spaceship close to an event, uh, a horizon might in principle escape a black hole, but is doomed in practice because of limited propulsion. It wouldn't have sufficient Propulsion. So maybe our progress toward this uh, singularity is like that. We're already toward the point of no return. This slide is particularly.
particularly challenging. And if you don't get it, that's, that's okay. A lot of very smart people think this slide is, is wrong. If you look up uh, on uh, Google Library of uh, Babel, you can learn more uh, about it. Um, so this is the idea of, that with too much information, the whole system becomes worthless. That you, if you had an infinitely large library containing all conceivable books, not only books properly printed, but those that were misprinted and those that were complete nonsense, you would not be able to find anything in that library. There's no search system that could help you. It would be just as bad as not having any books at all. And there, there are some outcomes here that are a little bit like that, of such tremendous overload that we cannot find what we're looking for. Maybe a society of increasing intelligence will be increasingly indistinguishable from noise when viewed from the outside. So he's thinking that it's not just a matter we can't figure out why the world is changing the way it is, but we can't understand what's going on at all when we look at it from the outside. If we, if we with our unaugmented human brains, try to figure out what's going on, we'll be unable. And it will be very much like this library of uh, Babel. Um, some of you may want an infinitely large library. <laughs> so it, it, it's interesting to toss this you know, idea. But really, you don't want that. You just want the valuable books and the ones that you'd be able to find through some sort of search and so on. <clears throat> Either way, outsiders cannot witness the true technological singularity. They would just see white noise. They would just see a lot of things that they don't understand hear white noise. Um, we don't know which way it's going to occur, whether basically the singularity will occur in some way in the world out there or within us, it, it, uh, you know, in, in an augmented human inside as opposed to a, an outward expansion. Um, you can take these things to their extremes, and the outward expansion would stop when all accessible convertible matter had been used up. Um, historically, mankind has always been outward expanding, so, so maybe that is the way this will go. Um, although in recent times, there has been more inward exploring, miniaturization, virtual reality, nanotechnology. <coughs> So the conclusion that Hutter comes to is strict intelligence singularity is neither experienced by insiders or by the outsiders. The insiders will just think that it's normal life because their mental processes are speeding up as fast as everything around them. So to them, there's nothing happening. It's just normal life. To somebody not participating, looking from the outside, they, they uh, cannot understand um, what's going on. They, they just see a kind of, uh, and here, uh, chaos. They don't see anything that they're able to un understand. So the insiders actively live the potential societal changes while the outsiders only passively observe them. Then a lot of this has to do with what intelligence is. And Marcus Hutter and the um, person working with him, Leg, Leg and Hunter have provided a collection of 70 plus definitions of what uh, intelligence ha is, not only by individuals, but also groups. And if it's not just speed, then what is it? We, we think it's probably not just speed. If I'm smarter than you are, it's not just and my brain works faster, it also works better? I don't, I don't know. So what, what, is, what does that mean? What will super intelligences actually do? <clears throat> and how do we judge that? Um, 
So in uh, evolution, mutation, recombination, selection increases intelligence if it's useful for survival and procreation. Um, in animals, higher intelligence via some correlated practical cognitive capacity increases the chance of survival and number of offspring. But in humans, that isn't true. That um, with increasing uh, intelligence, we may get more power and economic success, but it actually correlates negatively with the number of children. And genetic evolution in human societies was largely replaced by mimetic uh, evolution, the evolution of ideas. The replication, variation, selection, and spreading of ideas causing cultural uh, evolution. Which activities are intelligent? Are intelligent? Which activities does evolution select for? Self-preservation, self-replication, spreading, colonizing the universe. Remember that in your body, mo there are more bacterial cells than there are human cells. And those bacteria are spreading very successfully, but we don't think they're you know, intelligent. So there is a difference between uh, reproductive success and, and um, uh, intellect. So is, which activities does evolution select for Learning as much as possible, understanding the universe, maximizing power over men and organizations, transformation of matter into computronium, maximum self-sufficiency, search for the meaning of life. Hutter feels that in some sense intelligence uh, is related to rationality, reasoning toward a goal, more, the more flexible knowledge, notion is Expected utility maximization and cumulative lifetime reward maximization. Who provides the rewards and how? In animals, one can expect a lot of behavior as attempts to maximize rewards, pleasure, and minimize pain. In humans, they show an astonishing flexibility in choosing their goals and passions, and especially during childhood. How would you then reward robots? Uh, be direct reward by the teacher or rewards hardwired in? It's an important part of planning for the future. Goal-oriented behavior often appears to be at odds with long-term maximizing of pleasure. Still, the evolved biological goals and desires to survive, procreate, parent, spread, dominate are seldom disowned. Who sets the goals for superintelligences and how? Anyway, ultimately, we will lose control. So it, it's not like, I mean, many of you may think simplistically that machines are things that we build, and therefore, we'll never build one that can harm us because we'll build in safeguards so that we won't ever build, in, build one that will harm us. But because machines, as they become intelligent, one thing they'll become particularly good at is creating more machines like themselves and more machines better than, than themselves. So building in those safeguards will not work. Assuming that the machines are motivated to do that, motivated to build more Machines. Some aspects of this might be independent of initial goal structure and predictable. Evolving goals process, assuming that the initial virtual world is a society of cooperating competing agents, be a competition over limited computational resources. Those virtual entities which have the goal to acquire them will naturally become more successful in this endeavor compared to those with different goals. The successful virtual entities will spread in various ways, the others will perish. Soon, society will consist of virtuals whose goal is to compete over resources. Hostility will, be, will only be limited if this is in the virtual's best interest. It's kind of a scary statement. In other words, it could be an extremely hostile, competitive world 
without any of the human nuances. And, you know, every time you meet somebody in the hallway and say hi, that, that's, that's a way of reducing, you know, aggressive feelings, right? That, that's part of what we do all th throughout the day. And we could end up in a world where <laughs> that feature is missing. <clears throat> For instance, current society has replaced war mostly by economic competition. Since modern weaponry makes wars a loss for both sides, while economic competition in most cases benefits at least the better. Gold will survive and spread. Whatever amount of resources are available, quickly be used up, become scarce. So in any world inhabited by multiple in individuals, evolution and econom economic like forces will breed virtuals with the goal of acquiring as much computational resource as possible. Now you can think of alternative societies. So you could set in motion something where there is by definition no hostile uh, uh, competition. But that likely requires a powerful single virtual world uh, government which might have problems of its own. And to give up individual privacy and to severely limit individual freedom something like ant hives, uh, ant hills, beehives, or it requires a societal setup that can only produce conforming I individuals. Might by poss be possible by severely limiting individuals' creativity. So I've talked to you about everybody being on the top of Maslow's pyramid just when nobody's there. Everybody's down at the level of flocks of sheep and schools of fish. <clears throat> You're starting to get depressed. <laughs> I can see it coming. We'll, we'll come out of this void in a little bit. Monistic virtual world. Such well-regulated societies might better be viewed as a single organism or collective mind. And maybe the virtual world is inhabited from the outset by a single individual. Both virtual worlds could look different, more peaceful or dystopian than the traditional ones created by evolution. Intelligence would have to be defined quite differently in such virtual worlds. The adaptiveness of intelligence, another important aspect is how flexible or adaptive an individual is. Deep Blue might be the best chess player on earth, but is unable to do anything else. On the contrary, higher animals and humans have remarkably broad capacities can perform well in a broad range of tasks. Formal intelligence measure. Um, intelligence is the ability to achieve goals in a wide range of, of environments. This is Marcus Hutter's statement after he went over all those other definitions. Informal definition implicitly captures most, if not all, the traits of rational intelligence such as reasoning, creativity, generalization, pattern recognition, problem solving, memorization, planning, learning, self-preservation, many others. It's been rigorously formulated in mathematical terms. It's the most comprehensive formal definition of intelligence thus far. Copying and mer mer modifying virtual structures would become very, very easy. So, um, you value the knowledge in your brain very highly, but imagine if you transfer that to a non-biological substrate, if it's as easy to copy as any hard drive today is, then the value rapidly decrease, decreases. It's kind of de depressing to think. About that, the only cost is developing the structures in the first place and the memory to store and the um, computers to run them. Cheap manipulation, experimentation, copying of virtual life itself is possible. Copying and modifying virtual life, virtual explosion with life becomes much more diverse. In addition, virtual lives can be simulated at different speeds with speeders experiencing slower societal progress than laggards. So you could choose at what speed you, you want to live life. Designed intelligence will fill economic niches 
Current society already relies on specialists with many years of training. It's natural to go the next step to ease this process by designing our descendants, designer babies. The value of life, another consequence, should be that life becomes less valuable. Our society values life since life is a valuable commodity, expensive, laborious to replace, produce, raise. We value our own life since evolution selects only organisms that value their life. Human moral code mainly mimics this. So all our laws, all our ways of interacting with other human beings depend upon these ideas with some cultural differences and some excesses. If life becomes cheap, Motivation to value it will decline. Abundance lowers value. Cheap machines decrease the value of physical labor. Some expert knowledge was replaced by handwritten documents and printed books, finally even electronic files. Such transition reduces the value of the same information. Digital computers, in a very real sense, make human computers, that is, thinking humans, obsolete. In games, we value our own virtual life and that of our opponents less than real life because games can be reset and one can be resurrected. And that may become the case in life in general. Governments will stop paying my salary when they can get the same research output from a digital version of me essentially for free. And why not participate in a dangerous, fun activity when the worst case Scenario is that you get killed and have to be activated from a backup copy of yourself from yesterday and just missed out this one, anyway, not too well-going day. <laughs> Mark, that, that sounds better with a, a German accent when uh, Marcus reaches this point in the lecture. Anyway, the belief in immortality can alter behavior drastically. The value of virtual life, bottom line is when so little value is assigned to individual life, maybe it becomes disposable. So it's a very negative thing. So what's left? Are there universal values? Are there any universal values or qualities we want to see that should survive? What do we mean by we? Do we mean all humans? Or the dominant species or government at the time? The question is asked, could it be that diversity is the desirable value or friendly AI, could the long-term survival of at least one conscious species that appreciates its surrounding universe be a universal value? Okay, so now you're just deeply <laughs> depressed. That's the end of the Marcus Hutter slides. Now I'm gonna to talk to you about Future Day. Now this presentation to you about Future Day is different from what I've presented to any other class because always before I had a plan for exactly what we were doing for Future Day and in 2014 because March 1st falls on a Saturday I have much less of a plan than I've ever had before. So I'm relying on the 14 of you to come up with an idea that suits you. We don't have to do anything on that Saturday during that week, Julie Lin Wong is giving two lectures. She's lecturing on social media and medicine on the Tuesday and on 3D printing on the Thursday. And then she's talking at Nerd Night at the Citadel, also on 3D printing on the Thursday. We could celebrate uh, Future Day sometime during that week in a, in a way that seems fun and, and interesting. To you. So let me tell you a little bit about this idea of uh, Future Day. Um, our first Future Day in Edmonton was March 1st, 2012. You'll probably uh, see Joel Crichton there in the center. It was, he had um, a musical uh, performance on the day before and after mi midnight we celebrated <laughs> Future Day. And it was, but it was a small, uh, S celebration. Uh, that year, 2012, there were 16 celebrations of Future Day around the world. So this is intended to be a new holiday to get people thinking about the future. If this were a really successful initiative, then every year there'd be more places celebrating it. 
But it looks like it's going the other way, ladies and gentlemen. So in 2013, there were substantially fewer places that ce celebrated it and, and so on. So it, it's not like catching on like wildfire or anything, but I, it, it, it fits in well with this course. It's kind of a controversial on the one hand and cool uh, aspect of this course on the other. So I do intend for us to do something, but I want you to help me conceptualize what that something will be in 2014. This idea with Julie Lin Wong, I, I think of having something at you know, the art gallery, having you know, the Edmonton Salon competing with the intellectual ferment that occurred in, in Paris in the early 9, 1900s, uh, doing the same thing in Edmonton. We're not gonna be ready for, the, for that quite in March of 2014. I think 2015, give us another year, we, we, we might get there. So uh, Julie Lin Wong will be here. She can be part of, of whatever you guys decide to do with this big thing at you know, the art gallery. I don't feel we're ready for that. So we're talking about something low budget and relatively simple and therefore, it's within your capability to figure this out, right? It, it's not like something, it, it, it wouldn't be that dissimilar from a party that you yourself have planned in the past. So anyway, and any, any idea is uh, you know, open. So now this next slide, you <laughs> remember that these pictures were taken by this camera. So it's not like I, Look, I got to thinking about you guys and tried to figure out which ones of you I would photograph and put in this slide. That's, that's not really it. It's the software <laughs> inside this camera that made these decisions. Um, and for those of you who are not in these pictures, that doesn't mean anything. In it doesn't mean that I don't love you or anything. It, it's, it's, it's just uh, an accident of the pictures that the camera took. Mature, youthful decision-making. What do I mean? Well, let me tell you, you probably all know about this concept of reverse mentoring, but I think it's a very important positive factor in your life. Because there are people in their early 20s running big companies now and older people working for them, they look to the leader, this young 20-year-old, for wisdom, right? And so when somebody in their 40s, 50s, 60s looks to an early 20-year-old for wisdom, that's called reverse mentoring. It never existed in society before. What existed before was a hierarchical system where to get opportunities in life, you had to wait for somebody else to die. And that would take a long time, right? So you were like, you know, an indentured servant and, you know, all, all this sort of thing. So I know there are many bad things about being a young person today and all sorts of things that make you, 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 you uncertain about the future. But this idea of re reverse mentoring, which never existed before, is a very positive thing in your life because it means that somebody could suddenly decide that even though you're 20, whatever you are, you're the smartest person in the world and you're the only person who really knows what to do next. And it didn't used to be the case that that was so. Of course, if you go back, way back in uh, human history, people didn't live very long and so many of the leaders were young. So I mean, that, that was also true, right? But in the, in the intermediate period, there was this idea of people having you know, seniority and you only got certain privileges when you raise, rose in the ranks and there were already a lot of older people in the ranks. So I think that there's a tremendously freeing concept here of this reverse mentoring. Whatever bright ideas you think you're capable of, the idea that a bunch of older people would all be looking to you to tell them what to do and for leadership is really, really cool. You may not ever end up in that circumstance, but you could. And so this idea of your planning future day is kind of reverse mentoring, right? You're, you're going to tell me what you want us to do this year. 
It doesn't have to be great. There are no particular metrics for fantastic success. Re remember that there are fewer people <laughs> celebrating Future Day every year. So whatever we do is good, right? So, so that's, that's all you have to do is to figure out something we could do for Future Day that satisfies you and also satisfies me. So what, what is, how, how can we figure out this general idea of promoting thinking in this area? I continue to go back to the Big Bang Theory because at some subconscious level, anybody who enjoys that program, if you could reach them in the right way, could enjoy the subject matter of this course. Now there's a tremendous difference because a lot of people enjoy recreation a lot more than they enjoy work, right? So, uh, so yeah, you, you're, you're never going to get, you know, 20 million people all studying about the future or, or studying about uh, uh, exponential change. But, it, but it, it, it gives you some idea that there are that many people that you could, in some sense, potentially reach. Um, there, there, as some of you know, has been a specific episode of uh, Big Bang Theory. You can see that cloud there, that circled word of the singularity. And you also may know that uh, Woz, the co-founder of Apple, had a cameo um, on Big Bang Theory. Anyway. How are we going to make this special? Well, I think here, too, your ideas may win out, and the ideas that I have may not be the ones that we go with finally. I've been trying to think any successful holiday has to have pageantry, something visually memorable, you know, special foods, special ceremonies, something or other. And you, you may know the... Um, Holy Festival, H-O-L-I, from Asia. Uh, and uh, this is a situation where you have all these brightly colored pigments and you sprinkle them over people. And it involves people in all walks of life. So people that you would never, ever talk to in other circumstances, you're uh, sprinkling pigments on you and uh, vice versa began as something very benign, because these pigments came from plants and uh, were, were just you know, benign colored substances. But if you think about getting brightly colored pigments from plants, it's kind of limited. And you can more easily get this from paint factories and stuff and toxic uh, uh, ingredients. So now in uh, India and uh, other countries like that, around this ho holy festival, uh, there are many skin irritations and eye injuries and stuff from these toxic, um, you know, chemicals. And, and there are also people who get sprinkled with them who probably don't want to. <laughs> so, so, you know, odd uh, human rights uh, sides of it. But it does give you the idea of something we don't experience so much in our society here. That, 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 that would give a special flavor to this. This is what it looks like in its, in its extreme, this large crowd of people being sprinkled with these brightly colored pigments. I don't think you've had an experience quite like that. You may not want to ever have one, but anyway. So, you know, that may not appeal to you, <laughs> and, but I am um, sort of in this I idea of uh, bright colors. Uh, is something having to do with this holiday. Those of you brave enough to be on Facebook and then who beyond that have actually visited my Facebook page may have noticed there's only one poem there. And although I write poetry, it's not a poem by me. It's this poem called Crayola Bomb, which has always been the only poem uh, on, on the kind of you know, about portion of, of my Facebook page. Maybe we should develop a Crayola bomb as our next secret weapon, a happiness weapon, a beauty bomb. And every time a crisis developed, we would launch one. It would explode high in the air, explode softly 
and send thousands, millions of little parachutes into the air, floating down to earth, boxes of Crayolas. And we wouldn't go cheap either, not little boxes of eight, boxes of 64 with the sharpener built right in with silver and gold and copper and magenta and peach and lime and amber and umber and all the rest. And people would smile and get a funny look on their faces and cover the world with imagination. And that, 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 that's another way in which one could think about this holiday. If that doesn't do it for you, I don't know how many of you might have a robotic vacuum cleaner. And did you know if you do a time-lapse picture of your robotic vacuum cleaner, it looks like this. It's kind of cool, multicolored. And if even that doesn't do it for you, then hot air balloons may appeal to you. This, you know, hot air balloon festivals can be uh, some of the most visually colorful um, parades that one can find out there. And it, it couldn't be limited simply to visuals. It'd have to be poetry and song. And I wondered whether the windmills of your mind might maybe fit this new <clears throat> um, holiday round, like the circle in a spiral, like a wheel within a wheel, ever ending or beginning, on an ever spending reel, like a snowball down a mountain, carnival balloon, like a carousel that's turning, running rings around the moon, like a clock whose hinds are sweeping past the minutes of its face, and the world is like an apple whirling silently in space like the circles that you find in the windmills of your mind. I don't know whether any of those things strike a resonant chord with any of you, but what I would say with a reverse mentoring hat on here is, you know, show me something better. What, what do you think would make a success of Future Day. Does the idea make any sense to you? It's a moving target, right? The future is always in the future. Every other holiday celebrates something that's rather static, identifiable. Can you have a, 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 a holiday surrounding a moving target like that? How would it work? How would you interest people in this? How would you make it fun? What would the ceremony, what would the pageantry be? And it gets to these more general questions. How can we capture the imagination of the public to start everyone thinking on these matters? We need the mainstream public to regard the future technological singularity as fact, not fiction. We need to promote organized thinking beyond the future in universities and beyond. So this last slide, you may wonder about this, <laughs> if I could change of pace, but Marcus Hutter required that we make this the last slide, so here, here it is. So this is one, once again the reference to the source for the 38 slides of his that I used that put you in that deeply depressed mood. Hopefully the, the uh, hot air balloons have, have lifted you out of there. Um, and uh, the Journal of Consciousness Studies uh, David uh, Chalmers, you probably know that he, he's one of the most really exciting and interesting philosophers living uh, today. So it's kind of cool that, that he's gotten interested in this. So I've tried to mix things in a way that would not be completely dysphoric, realizing that part of today is like awful. And so uh, hopefully I, I, there were some parts of today that that you almost maybe liked, and, and so putting it all uh, together, maybe it wouldn't be that bad. And hopefully, like I was talking about, remembering parts of courses where the guy jumps up on the desk, maybe parts of today are like that. So be some, something that you could remember. Okay, so that's the end of the lecture, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions. You have to speak into the microphone. So. So turn it on so the green light shows. Yep, we're, we're ready. Yep. So um, 
When, when did you want to start presenting ideas for Future Day? When, when I think anytime you want to talk about uh, ideas for uh, Future Day, we, we can talk about, yeah. I, I mean, uh, also the, the question is whether this is going to be separate from the student uh, presentations. We, we had proposed that there would be students who wish to present early that, that might present on March 13th. So maybe we'd want to celebrate Future Day 13 days late on March 13th, or maybe we want to move the student presentations earlier, or maybe none of you want to uh, present early. It sort of depends upon your life uh, situation. You'd still have the opportunity to turn in the, the, the paper, the written paper, a week before the end of the course. So that would be the same as for, for the other students, but, but you would just get the uh, you know, deadline for the, the uh, uh, oral uh, presentation out of the way. And we would mix that with pizza and entertainment and other things. So we could conceivably mix one of the student presentation evenings with uh, Future Day. I still have you know, the banner that I showed you, and you know, we've got some, some cool visuals uh, from the past. Other questions? Yeah. Well, so sort of related to the same topic, uh, what's the exact budget that you're planning for the event? So we sort of know <laughs> RTIs are sort of in scope or way out of the universe. So. See, you, you guys keep putting questions to me as if you think I don't have an answer, but I actually do, yeah. So how much could, could we spend? Uh, I don't know, we could spend 500, I don't know, something like that. Yeah, sort of, we don't have to spend that much, but we could. If we, the, the, the more we spend, the, ha the more you know, impressive it has to be for the outside world. We, we can't spend 500 bucks and just have a fantastic party lo locally that there's nothing we can report to the outside world. We'd have, have to have you know, pretty good video and, and still pictures and make other people in the world really jealous that we had the best future day anywhere on the planet and they better get their ass in, in gear and, and do, do their own thing next time. You know? so, so yeah, that, that, those would sort of be my thoughts. Yeah. <clears throat> Other questions, comments? Yeah. So this is going back, <clears throat> sorry, to the, the lecture component on the singularity. I hope you don't mind. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, um, perhaps you could speak to this or another student can speak to it. I, I have a hard time, like I was watching Marcus Hutter's lecture and I have a really hard time believing that um, it, with sufficient intelligence, consciousness is just some threshold that we pass. Um, like. He was talking about being able to uh, sort of reset yourself if you if you die and then go back to a previous copy that was the day before um, that you had created kind of as a backup or something. And he talked about um, being able to, you know, have consciousness move through different substrates, different time periods. Like, I have a really hard time um, wrapping my head around that. The fact that intelligence reaching a certain point just gives you consciousness. You know what I mean? Yes. No, no, I, I understand that, but you see, these are not just uh, the theoretical questions. We'll, we'll be able to solve some of this very soon. So what do I mean by that? Right now, it's not possible to take uh, mammals that we consider reasonably you know, intelligent, like let's say mice, rats, and freeze them and bring them back. But when, when we're able to, to do that, that will answer some big questions. Like if you say, okay, hold that thought, I'm gonna freeze you and bring you back in two years. When we bring you back in two years, do you still hold the same thought? Or are you now psychotic and completely different person? You know, that, like how much of what we are is just a freezable part of what's going on in our brains and how much is something beyond that? You know, 
is there a soul, you know, all, all, all of a sudden, it, it, how, how, mu how much of us is contained in specific electrical activity in the brain? Is it really the whole thing? Can I recreate your brain in some non-biological substrate and will that really react the same as you would, would react as a, you know, biological human? It, the, the thing about these questions is by studying other, you know, animals over the next few years, I think we'll know the answer. It, it's it's going to be really, really exciting. This idea of hold that thought, i come back to you in, you know, two years, five years, ten years, that, 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 um, is a you know testable thing. We can't test it right now, but someday we will be able to. You realize that anybody who argues that beyond a certain intellectual level that consciousness just naturally appears, that's a very easy way out be of explaining consciousness, which is almost impossible to do, right? So just say, well, it's obvious that beyond a certain intellectual level, consciousness will magically appear. Um, I don't think it's that simple, but we will find out. And yeah, Marcus Hutter thinks it's just a matter of how smart the thing is. And beyond a certain intellectual level, it's automatically conscious, self-aware. Yeah, that, that's his belief. And you can't criticize him for being too simplistic because in many other ways he's not simplistic at all. Just in, the, in, in this one area, he's sort of taken what seems like the intellectual easy way out. So other questions? Yes, Earl. So one of the interesting things is that you and I will be dead and everybody else in this room are going to live in singularity. So I, I wonder if there's a, a kind of disconnect that you and I have with everybody else here because they're, <laughs> they're, uh, they're going to experience this and we're not, uh, which makes me kind of jealous, I suppose, in a way to, to um, uh, to hear about this, but I just wonder uh, what the reaction of the students would be to uh, to that fact. Yeah, I guess we're 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 not certain of that, but it 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 there is a certain likelihood that by 2045, Earl and I will be dead, and none of you will. So <laughs> that's that's true, but I. I don't know how, how important that is. Um, but I, I guess what I will tell you is, uh, up until now, although I've been telling students they're going to actually experience this, I never had a student tell me that they thought that they would. So I'm not sure that I've convinced a single young person, <laughs> including the videographer, <laughs> that this is really going to happen to you. I mean, I, I, I know that you think I'm an honest guy, and you probably believe most things that I tell you, but I'm not sure that you really, in some general, you know, um, psychological sense, really, you don't buy that. This seems like a foreign idea to you. I, I think, and that's still true for you all. Um, but as we get closer and closer to it, I, I think it, it, it it will become, at least to you, to some of you, it will become more real. So what do you, what do you think? Am I right about that, that, that you absolutely reject the idea that you will experience this? And why do you think you, you know, reject this idea? You've seen the graphs and so on. You, you can figure, yes, I'll probably be alive then, but no, I don't think, that, so do you wanna bring her the microphone or? Thanks. Yeah. <coughs> I had to jump on the question when you said graphs. So if we go back to Moore's law, and there was another picture out there I think you had that was talking about um, the growth of the economy over time. For me, when I look on the internet, I don't even see axes on some of these things. And I think, okay, how are you measuring this? What's the exponential rate? How are you defining it? 
it could often very much be just we want to see a pattern when there's nothing really. So I think when we start thinking about the singularity coming in 2045, a big question for me is, okay, so we think singularity is going to come in a couple of years, but under what conditions? And are we just trying to see something that we want to see? So my question back to you in a little bit more specific way would be, uh, what would that machine that has so much intelligence be like? I'm not very familiar with the topic. Yeah, so. yeah. No, no, I, I think that's what we all wonder. And so the reason I thought that the movie was, was valuable for us is most, you know, depictions are like, you know, the Terminator and that sort, sort of thing. It's, it's a tremendously scary, uncaring machine entity that has motivations that have nothing to do with furthering human welfare. And, and so, whereas in her, the, the idea is that these machines have gotten really good at being friendly to humans. They're a better friend than any human could be a friend to somebody else. And then they self-improve beyond that. And they start to experience, as they say in, in the movie, the space between the words, you have no idea how much, you know, um, the, the, the uh, tremendous universe of experience that exists in the space between the words that you humans can't, you know, experience and so on. So, um, if it's like that, then it's going to be really fun because they're cooperating with, with us, they're designed from, from the beginning to be kind of our friends. And they get friendship and enhancing human in interaction fine-tuned to a point beyond what any human being could ever do. And then they, they bring back famous people from the past who really cool to get to know, and now they, they have recreated these people in software, so you can talk to famous people from the past. And, yeah, I mean, that, that, that could be a wonderful life that these machines could help us create. Um, now, the movie has been criticized because uh, they didn't get enough computer scientists <laughs> to, to you know, advise them, but is, is, is that a logical criticism? I mean, the, the guy started writing this story from his own experience with one of these primitive uh, chat programs, you know, uh, Eliza, which was a computer program where you'd en enter text and the computer would give you text back. It was actually pretty good. And, and, and so that's the way the writing of the story began. It's not that he needed a you know, computer scientist to give him the idea. He got the idea from the computer itself, right? About uh, 20 years ago or something. And so, I, the bottom line is I don't know what this super intelligent computer will be like, but I think we can look at a range of possibilities from the you know, Terminator to her and, and everything in, in between, and lots of variations that we haven't thought of. Um, another way to think of this is not that her got it wrong, but that we could aim toward that, that uh, uh, outcome. I mean, right now, human beings are creating machines, right? So, I mean, we, we have some say in the matter now, even if we won't later, later and let's try to create a you know, beneficial, benign machine like, like the ones that we see in that film. Um, yeah. For technology, we need resources to build them, right? Do you think we'll have enough resources by 2045? Because, like, um, aren't they using, like, non-reusable resources most of the time to like, create them? Well, we, we're running out of time, but it's a very important question. It has to do with, you know, elitism. Is everything we talk about this in this course just for a few rich people or is for all human beings? And when we talk about the post-scarcity uh, outcome where the cost of everything descends to approximately zero and we can have whatever we want, is that true for everybody on, on Earth or for people living in Silicon Valley, in California? You know, how, how, 
wide, widely extended is this? So I can't answer that. We will also talk about a Star Trek world without money and stuff like that. We don't know that, I, I know that right now if somebody asks you who you are, you, you begin describing your work and what you're doing and so on. We're probably going to reach a time where none of us are working. It doesn't make sense. We're doing something else. And we're being supported somehow to live on the earth in some way that just logically makes sense. We don't know exactly how that's going to work. So the question about resources is a really big and complicated one. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. See you next Tuesday. <laughs>